Evet, sağ herkese günaydın. Size bakma en geç kaldığım için trafik de dolayı böyle oldu. Hava pek şeydi. Hospitable değil bugün gördüğünüz gibi. Um, today lecture will be held in English. Uh, in English. I see at least three people smiling at me. Hopefully that's a positive smile, not a negative. Is there anyone who doesn't speak English or who doesn't understand English? If you don't, please don't tell us because in your Bashur, in your application, it was written that you do so. <laughs> That's what I learned now. So we are not going to, we are not going to spoil your chances to get the certificate, right? Uh, so um, today's lecture is going to be held in English, and it's going to be on Cyprus and. Uh, the effect on of Cyprus issue or Cyprus problem or Cyprus conflict, however you wish, um, on the Turkish foreign policy or the relations between Turkish foreign policy and the Cyprus issue. Um, my name is Sylvia Tiriaki and uh, I'm a lecturer at uh, Istanbul Kultur University International Relations Department. I have been uh, working here, I have been lecturing at this department for the last 13 years. At the same time, I used to be Cyprus project coordinator at uh, one of the uh, think tanks based in Istanbul, Turkish think tanks, uh, called TESEF. And I was working as Cyprus project coordinator at TESEF uh, between 2003 and 2008. In uh, 2008, I co-founded uh, another think tank, which is called Global Political Trend Center, and it's a think tank based here at this university. Um, and uh, we continue working on the Cyprus issue. Why I'm giving you this short background of mine is that um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer and also an international relations person by background and also um, by experience. But Cyprus, Cyprus issue is something that I have been working on uh, for many years. So, I mean, it's not only my academic interest um, which I have in Cyprus, uh, in Cyprus conflict, but it's something uh, what I have been focusing and paying attention and dedicating my time and energy for the last almost 15 years. So hopefully, hopefully we will have a fruitful discussion. Uh, I definitely don't prefer, and I see a couple of my students here, and they know that I don't like uh, um, lectures which are conducted in a way of monologue. Uh, I definitely prefer interactive lecture, and I prefer uh, form of dialogue because I would like to hear from you as well. Um, I don't claim that I know everything and I'm definitely very much willing to learn from, from you as well and I'm 100% sure that I'm going to learn from your questions if not from something else. So, um, I was thinking how to, how to start this lecture, how to... The Cyprus problem, Cyprus issue is... Uh, um, I wouldn't call it complicated issue because every single conflict is complicated. And I'm looking at Maha and I don't want to kidnap the complication of, <laughs> of conflicts by, by claiming that Cyprus is the most complicated one. She wouldn't definitely agree with me and I wouldn't definitely agree with myself. But it's a complex issue. And in two hours it's almost impossible to cover such a complexity in its entirety. So I'll try to summarize as much as I can, and uh, then I'll try to keep, uh, or I, I will try to somehow leave some time also for, uh, for questions, questions and answers. So, what I was thinking, I, I think that we can divide, uh, divide this lecture into two main parts. I'm not going to bother you with too much uh, or too many technicalities of the issue because that's what you can find at the internet. If you are interested in something, you can always ask me. Um, I would like to divide this into into two, and one of them uh, into two parts. And the first part would be about Cyprus problem per se, Cyprus problem as it is, right? What the conflict is about, when it started, how it started, who are the main actors, etc., etc. The other, the other. Half of the of the lecture will be will be focusing on um, Cyprus problem, Cyprus problems 
plays a role in Turkish foreign policy. So, and if we have time, if we have time, um, I would prefer to focus also on the Cyprus issue as it is nowadays. Plus, perhaps, on, and it's a part of it, we can talk a bit about the gas and oil issue in the Eastern Mediterranean because that's that's the issue which kidnapped the discussion about about Cyprus problem, uh, especially especially these days. So, what is the what is Cyprus conflict, what it is about, when it started. There are two different competing narratives. Uh, as in every single conflict or other conflicts, each side has its own narrative. Each side, the party to the conflict, sees the situation from its own perspective from its, and has its own understanding of, uh, of the events. These narratives usually are so much conflicting, I mean, if they were not conflicting, there would be no conflict, right? So, I mean, obviously, in Cyprus issue, we have at least two different two different narratives. In Cyprus issue, there are two main actors, Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. There are other actors as well, but uh, why I mentioned Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots is because these two, these two um, groups or these two, let's say, people, uh, they have to find a way how to share the island. They are living on the island, and it's their primary responsibility to somehow to find a way out of the uh, of the conundrum. So the um, Greek Cypriot narrative is that Cyprus conflict started in 1974. What happened in 1974? In 1974, Turkey military intervened in the island's issues. Uh, there was a military intervention. There were two military interventions. The first one was in, according, in accordance with the Treaty of Guarantee. We will talk about it a bit later. The second one, not really, uh, but again, I mean, we can talk about it uh, later. Uh, result of this uh, military intervention was a permanent status quo is the division of the island. There was the green line was, uh, was created, or the buffer zone was created, and the island is divided between north which is inhabited by the Turkish Cypriots, and in which the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus was constituted in 1983, not in 1974. In 1983, there was a unilateral in the, uh, declaration of independence of Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, or KKTJ as we know it in Turkish. Um, and uh, so, as I said, like Turkey intervened militarily upon the Article 4 of the Treaty of Guarantee Turkish. So, um, and for Greek Cypriots, this is the beginning of the problem, the beginning of the conflict. Because by that time, by that time, they enjoyed rather, um, I would say, well, I mean, they didn't need to share anything, basically. But from 1974, they had to share the territory, they lost properties, they lost lives. For Turkish Cypriots, the conflict started in 1963. In 1963, what happened? The Republic of Cyprus collapsed. The Republic of Cyprus collapsed in such a way that Turkish Cypriots lost their position in the government and they were pushed into enclaves which were comprising only of 3% of the territory of the entire island. So uh, the problem, the tragedy for them started in 1963 11 years be before 1974. Um, yeah, as I said, like the narratives are different, but we have to go to the beginning of the problem or the beginning of the, uh, I would say, um, the, the, the conflictual understanding of the, of the entire issue to understand why the and how these two conflicting narratives uh, happen to be or how they, how they took the place. So, um, I don't know how much you know about the history of, uh, of the island. Uh, I will not go definitely into the uh, pre-Ottoman period, because that's, that would be too much to talk about, right? I mean, uh, who knows something about Cyprus? So, I'm, you know... Okay, what do you know, in, in few words, about the history of the island? Just tell me.
wonderful. And what about you? Who was the other one who knew something? The same thing. It's interesting that you said it at the beginning. Uh, you are referring to the year. Do you know what was the year? The beginning you referred to? No, I mean, the beginning, you said like in the beginning, Cyprus was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. So the beginning is 1571 when Selim II conquered the island. But he conquered the island. So don't you think it's wrong to call it the beginning? The beginning of what? But I mean, you know, I'm, it's not a criticism, it's just the remark that, you know, we have to... <laughs> but I will not go before the, the beginning you mentioned. But uh, the island was conquered from whom? Who was ruling before Ottomans? Because, I mean, maybe for someone, beginning is the Ottoman Empire, but there was also a pre period before Ottoman Empire, right? I mean, 5071 is not such a ancient time. So, what was the... Uh, yeah. Venetians? Venetians, exactly. So, Venetians, or Italians, or however we call them, were the rulers of the island. Before, there were other civilizations on the island. Yeah? The island is quite, quite old, yeah? so for thousands of years, 10,000 of years, there were different civilizations, different people living on the island, and so on and so on. And as we know, uh, the civilizations are changed through the wars, usually. So the island was conquered from one hand to another hand. But let's start from the beginning, from 1571, I really like that. Um, so as, uh, as you said, um, Salim II, he, uh, he conquered the island from the Venetians, and uh, what happened What happened the next? I mean, what was, what was happening during that period? There were, basically, there were other minorities like uh, Maronites. Maronites are still living on the island, they are minority, they are people of Lebanese origin, uh, but they are Christians, they speak four languages, Arabic, French, uh, English, Greek. Uh, they don't speak usually Turkish, but the main people on the island are Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. Now, um, many people refer to those two entities as Turks of Cyprus and Greeks of Cyprus. I think it's completely wrong. I think those people are the local people and they are Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. This is how I, how I prefer to refer to them. And I think that they, that's how they prefer to refer to themselves as well. Um, all through this period, all through the Ottoman Empire period, uh, Turkish Cypriots who were uh, Muslims and Greek Cypriots who were Orthodox Christians, they usually did not mix with each other. So there are other theories that, you know, there are one people, that they are genetically similar, that they have been always the same, and in 1974 the island was divided and so on, and all this is a, a you know, fault of Turkey and so on. It's, it's, again, it's, it's not correct reading of the history at all. Um, these two communities did not really mix. They were living uh, in, sometimes in uh, mixed villages, but most of the time the villages were very separate. There were Orthodox villages, Christian Orthodox villages, and, and, and Muslim villages. Uh, when it came to, that's about the family life. When it came to their professions, uh, Muslim subjects were involved in uh, bureaucracy, they were, holding, they were holding the bureaucratic post in governance and in military. The Greek Orthodox could not hold any post in military or governance, and they were usually involved in commerce, trade, and so on. Uh, other subjects, Muslim subjects, were usually farmers, uh, which means that they were owners of the land, right? Because farmers are usually owning the land. Later, the land was transferred to Efkas, yeah, to this back of... Uh, Foundation, sorry, what is it? Foundation, I think. Um, the um, so basically they were they were living this way. But uh, what happened in uh, 18, 1878, uh, As a result, as a result uh, of a British Ottoman defense agreement against against the Russians, uh, Ireland was first off unofficially lent to British. It was you know, like, it was rented, basically, land. And then later on, later on, it became, uh, but it was still officially under Ottoman sovereignty. Later on, it became uh, completely and officially and legally under the British administration, and it became a British colony. 
uh, in this period, in this period, Greek Cypriots or Greek Cypriots started flirting with the idea of enosis. And actually, idea of enosis and corresponding idea of taksim on the Turkish side, on the Turkish Cypriot side, uh, they have been the main, let's say, narratives shaping uh, ideas behind the behind the conflict, right? I mean, enosis and taksim uh, were two different bases for two different nationalism on the island. What is enosis? Who knows what enosis is? What I'm referring to if I'm when I'm talking about enosis. Enosis was uh, and still in some um, nationalist mindset among the uh, among the Greek Cypriots and in some uh, Greek uh, Greek minds as well. Enosis is the unification of island with the mainland Greece. Uh, they call they they were talking about reunification, but uh, I think it's completely wrong because I just mentioned that you know Ottomans conquered from Venetians, so it's difficult to talk about reunification. I think the proper word would be unification. So in 19th century, in 19th century, uh -huh, so the idea of unification is, uh, of enosis is not stemming from uh, 1960s events. It goes back to the 19th century to the Greek nationalism. So. Uh, Greek Cypriots they started flirting with the idea of enosis, as I said, in uh, in the 19th century, and this was a part of wider Hellenic Hellenic movement of 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 those years. This got somehow uh, reaction in Turkish uh, Cypriot society in form of taksim. Taksim means separation, right? So while Greek Cypriots wanted to unite the entire island with Greece and other Hellenic, uh, Hellenic uh, people, Turkish Cypriots wanted to divide the island and rule its own part somehow, the way or the other. It was not, there was no, no mention of unification with Turkey mainland, yeah? It's Taksim is the separation, not unification. Uh, what happened now, in, then later in uh, 1914, when Ottomans enter the first, uh, World War the First uh, against the against the Allies, uh, Britain uh, annexed Cyprus entirely, completely. And uh, so, basically, I don't know. In I don't know whether you know that, but in 1915, one year later, one 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 year after the island Cyprus became officially British colony, in 1915, British offered Ireland. Uh, to Greece, uh, to their king, uh, to Greek, because Greece, Greece was ruled by, it was a kingdom those years, and uh, so they offered the island to Greece, but Greece refused in 1915. They said that they didn't want to have Cyprus as a part of the, you know, greater Greece or Hellenic, Hellenic lands, and uh, so the island uh, stayed as a British colony for the next 40 years. All through these years, as I said, there were two competing nationalism, one for Enosis, one for, uh, for Taksim. They, you know, so basically in 20th century it was, it was nothing new when the clashes occurred. Um, the proponent of the uh, Greek Cypriot nationalism on the island was an uh, organization which was called EOKA. We know basically two EOKAs, they are still, it's not completely, these organizations are not completely er eradicated. Elka A and Elka B, Elka A and Elka B. Um, this organization was later on targeting uh, Turkish Cypriots. They were the main force behind uh, the killings which started actually, uh, or which somehow were the uh, main factor behind, uh, behind uh, the collapse of the Republic. Uh, but their activities or terrorist activities or call them, I don't know, um, uh, clandestine activities, in the beginning were targeting actually British. So they were not, you know, against the Turkish Cypriots in the beginning, but against the British, uh, British masters or British rulers. Uh, EOKA was, again, I mean, had its own reflection on the Turkish Cypriot side. Uh, on the Turkish Cypriot side, uh, the organization was called TMT, TMT, and uh, basically, I mean, again, I mean, the main, main, let's say, um, 
I don't know, the features of their, of their nationalism was again the Taksim and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Enosis. The uh, ratio of the population. Do you know what is the ratio of the population between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots? So, all through the history, it has not changed much. It has been always like 80% of the island Greek Cypriots, 20% of the islands Turkish Cypriots, approximately, because there was a huge immigration from the island, then migration to the island, and so on. But approximately, we can say 80 to 20. So, um, um, and then later on, what happened? Uh, the motherlands, the motherlands, Anavatan, uh, entered the picture. And, uh, you know, Turkey didn't want to be, uh, honestly, Turkey didn't want to be involved in the Cyprus issue very much in the beginning, before before 50s. It was actually Britain uh, who was trying to, who was trying to uh, engage Turkey um, Turkey in the Cyprus issue, and it was uh, it was like Britain was basically trying to secure its own national interest, uh, but also its NATO obligation. And the main reason why they wanted Turkey to be uh, to be involved those days, not Ottoman Empire anymore, but Turkey to be involved in the Cyprus issue was the uh, protection of the Suez Canal. But that's a that's that's another issue, I and mean, we will have to spend another half an hour talking about it. But uh, anyway, be that as it may, uh, in 1959, after the struggle for independence, for Enosis, for Taksim, and so on and so on, in 1959, uh, so-called Zurich-London agreements establish, establish the, uh, the new statehood on the island, and Cyprus became a republic, independent republic. Now, independent like independent, because it was, and it has never been completely independent. The Cyprus Republic, which was established in 1959, was established by three treaties. Treaty of Guarantee, Treaty of Establishment, and Treaty of Alliance. And these three treaties are not signed only by Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. They are signed by Greece, Great Britain, and Turkey. And Greece, Great Britain, and Turkey are, have been, and still are, guarantor powers of the existence of Republic of Cyprus. So it's very difficult to talk about the independent Cyprus Republic even now, because the constitution which was uh, enacted in 1960 is still valid. I mean, it is not really functioning in its original version, but it is still valid. These treaties are constitutional treaties. It means that if treaty of guarantee ceases to exist, all treaties, three treaties, fall. It means that the treaty of establishment would cease to exist as well. It means that the constitution of Republic of Cyprus nowadays would be defunct. It means that the Republic of Cyprus would cease to exist. That's why even though Greek Cypriots are talking about the uh, bad sides of the treaty of guarantee, they don't touch it. Because legally, according to international law, these three treaties are interconnected in such a way that if one of them is defunct, all three are defunct. So, um, as I said, uh, these three treaties established the Republic of Cyprus in 90, 1959, 90, 1960. And uh, this, was, this Republic of Cyprus was functioning for three years, basically, till 1963. Uh, what was the what was uh, what was the setup? Very briefly, because I mean I, I don't want to go into the uh, into the entire entire uh, let's say structure of the original Republic of Cyprus. But we have to know that they were official and still they are according to the Republic of Cyprus Constitution two official languages. One of them is Greek. One of them is Turkish. Why I'm mentioning this is because Republic of Cyprus meanwhile became a member of European <coughs> Union in 2004. And according to Aki Communitaire, European Union law, all official languages of member states become, must become, official languages of European Union. But Turkish language has never become an official language of European Union, right? So this is something which is not really in accordance of Aki Communitaire, of European Union law. And uh, how they explain it, uh, Greek Cypriots explain it in such a way that it's because of the 
doctrine of necessity. It's a doctrine which is a part of international law, but actually states are using it rather uh, deliberately. Whenever something doesn't function, then they use the doctrine of necessity, that it has to be done in a different way, not according to the, uh, to the real rules, let's say. Anyway, so two official languages, president was, uh, president was uh, Greek Cypriot. Do you know the name of the first president of the Republic of Cyprus? Of the Republic of Cyprus. I'm not talking about the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hmm? Samson. Uh, Samson. Makarios. Samson was actually... Uh, he was Eoka leader, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's good that he was not the first president with all the crimes he committed, actually. But anyway, so Makarios, uh, he was a priest, and uh, vice president was Turkish. Still, again, eh? Fazl Kuchuk, Dr. Fazl Kuchuk was the first vice president of Republic of Cyprus. There was no Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus then. I told you when the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus was established. What was the year? I told it to you in the beginning of the lecture. 1983, by unilateral declaration of independence. Actually, there was an attempt in 1975 for a federative state, but then it was, uh, I mean, that's what happened later on. So two official languages, Vice President Turkish uh, Cypriot, uh, President Greek Cypriot, um, all the uh, state organs, all the state institutions were having mixed uh, representation, Turkish Cypriot, Greek Cypriot. Do you know what was the ratio? I said the ratio of the population is 80 to 20. What was the ratio in the state organs, in the state institutions? 70 to 30. So Turkish Cypriots were represented by 30%, Greek Cypriots were represented by 70%. So what happened in 19, so for three years this was functioning, more or less, in, 97, in 1963 uh, there was a coup d'etat, or there was a, I would say, um, with the support of Greece, of some uh, clandestine support from Greece, the, um, uh, uh, the Greek Cypriots uh, somehow, um, I don't know how to put it in nice words, but uh, the Turkish Cypriots were taken out of the um, of the political institutions of uh, everything, council, presidency, and so on and so on. Um, there are some stories like uh, when the Turkish Cypriot, who was an official, didn't want to leave, his chair was pulled out. You know, I mean, in the, in the state institution, physical violence did not occur, but I mean, they were nicely sent sent away. Uh, and during those next 11 years uh, Republic of Cyprus was run exclusively by Greek Cypriots. Yeah? So the organs and everything was uh, purely uh, purely represented by, by, by the Greek Cypriots. Now, um, I, I slowly I would, like to, I would like to come to the conclusion of this historical part because I don't want to dwell on that too much. But what are the main or outstanding problems of this situation nowadays. Oh, and then in 1974, I didn't go there, but I mean, that's a, I, I presume that most of you know much about 1974 and less about, about the period before. That's why I'm not that much focusing on 1974. But in 1974, Turkey intervened upon the Article 4 of the Treaty of uh, Guarantee, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, then there was the second intervention and uh, uh, Turkish military stayed in the island. Um, honestly, as someone who has been dealing with international law, the second intervention was not really in accordance with the Treaty of Guarantee, and the Treaty of Guarantee is asking guarantor powers only to establish an order, not to stay forever militarily present on the island. I'm not saying that the troops should leave or whatever, that's a different part of the story. Uh, diplomacy and politics would be easy if everything were, uh, you know, very so simple, black and white, but I mean, uh, back to the back to the international law and the treaties. This was this was the case. So uh, main outstanding problems, main outstanding issues, as I see it. If you get different lecture, if you get different, uh, you would get different view. You might get different view, might not. Um, negotiations, negotiations, bilateral negotiations between 
Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots have been ongoing since 1968. Since 19, so before 1974. Since 1968, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots have been trying officially to find a way out to, because they are on the island, right? With representation, without the representation, they are there, they have to share it. I mean, it's, uh, nobody is going to remove the other population the way or the other, unless I have no idea what would happen in the world under current circumstances, that's out of the question. So they have to find the way out of this. So since 1968, they have been negotiating all, almost the same issues. Since 1975, the federal solution is on the table. It was Turkey in 1975 which proposed the federation. It's 2015, we are still discussing federation. What, how the federation uh, could look like, what it should encompass, what it should be, what it should not be. All parameters are on the table. Uh, what is missing, I guess, is the political will to move ahead. The parameters which are being discussed or which have been discussed are property and territory, how much property, because you know, I mean, all through this conflict, lots of people became dispossessed owners and secondary dispossessed owners. And you know it, those who are coming from conflicting areas, you know that, uh, uh, you know, hardly there is any conflict without losing properties. And uh, I think it was Machiavelli who said that one man forgets easier the debt of his own father than loss of his property. I mean, I, I wouldn't be one of those men, definitely, but, you know. So property issue in many conflicts uh, is uh, something serious, and that's why, for instance, Anam Plan in 2004 uh, was very difficult to conclude, and the property section was the most difficult section. Not even governance not even territory, property, how much money, how much land people would get back. That was the main issue. So, guarantee, security are other issues which have been discussed. Economy, citizenship, EU metros, because now Republic of Cyprus is officially a member of Euro European Union, and power sharing, power sharing and, go and governance. These are the main issues which have been discussed, and as I said, the talks have been going ongoing since 1960. 68. On purpose, I'm emphasizing this. Second issue, outstanding issue, UN involvement. Do we know since when United Nations uh, have been involved in the Cyprus issue? When United Nations became involved in Cyprus issue? 64. 1964. With, it's like whenever United Nations become involved in something, it must be based on what? How do they become involved? Like, let's go, guys. I mean, that's a nice island. It's sunny. Let's go there. After, after the Akrita Plan of Elka in 1960. Akrita's Plan, you, you mentioned, you, you referred to Akrita's Plan. Akrita's Plan, yes, I mean, it was there, but uh, Akrita's Plan is one of those conspiracy theories. Uh, we don't really, you know, I'm not fond of conspiracy theories. So, and I don't think that the United Nations was basing its presence on the island. On, on the document. By the way, I'm referring, or I have been referring in my writings to Akrita's plan, Akrita's plan many times. Now recently, in Turkey, I heard that, you know, uh, how do you say, the verification of the document is a bit, uh, it's a bit uh, shaky, so. It's just for your future academic consumption, yeah? Then you refer, and I have done that. When you refer to Akrita Span in future, just check twice. So, uh, not Akrita Span, but I mean, I'm referring to some, to something which is, which is uh, without which, or which is a sine qua non of UN presence in some conflict. It must be based on what? On Security Council resolution, right? So what was the Security Council resolution in, uh, in Cyprus case? 186 from 60, 64. This resolution, why this resolution was adopted? What was the main reason behind this resolution? To save Turkish Cypriots' lives, right? Because Turkish Cypriots were attacked by EOKA and so on and so on. But this resolution is both good and bad. 
It was there, it established the presence of uh, United Nations peacekeeping forces, but at the same time, it confirmed the fact that Republic of Cyprus government was consisted only of Greek Cypriots. Because such a resolution, in order to have peacekeeping forces in some place, you can't establish peacekeeping mission in any conflict without the consent of the state, right? So who conceded? Who gave the consent in the Republic of Cyprus? The government of Republic of Cyprus in 1964. Who were the members of Republic of Cyprus government in 1964? Only Greek Cypriots, because in 1963 all Turkish Cypriots were taken out. When you talk to Greek Cypriots, they claim that actually they have a legitimate government because of this resolution 186. They claim that actually this resolution confirmed the fact that it's okay to have only them in the government. Yes, yeah, so this resolution was both good and, and bad. There have been a couple of good analysis of this resolution. Uh, Turkish Cypriots were not represented there, they were represented by Turkey. And uh, behind the scene, uh, former president, late president Dektash, he said that actually uh, they were convinced that it was actually for the good sake of Turkish Cypriots to sign the resolution as soon as possible so the Turkish Cypriot life can be, can be saved and so on and so on. But well, I mean, again, like, you know, it's very difficult to talk about anything. So the involvement since 1964, since that time, almost every single council, uh, secretary general of United Nations came up with a peace plan for Cyprus, right? Butros, Butros, Gali, Gali set of ideas. Uh, Kweyar, again, the main principles. The latest attempt was an unplan, which uh, ended up with fiasco in 2004, when it was put on the referenda, and Greek Cypriots refused it, and Turkish Cypriots approved it. Uh, there was a main carrot behind it, it was e European Union membership, and the unplan plan was, uh, designed and uh, constructed in full cooperation with European Union. So Anaplan's articles are actually written in such a way that uh, Turkey is a part of this because Turkish membership, EU, EU membership became connected with, with the, the positive outcome of the referenda and so on and so on and so on. So every single, every single council general came up with the Anaplan, only Ban Ki-moon is uh, staying behind. He knows what he is doing because he realized, or the United Nations already realized, that it's of no use. Anam plan was nothing new. Anam plan's plan was a compilation of the previous plans. As I mentioned, the talks have been going on since 1968. Everything has been discussed. I have a very good friend. Uh, he was the former, he's a presidential candidate now. We know that the uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus presidential elections are upcoming. Uh, one of the presidential candidates who was a member, uh, who was the uh, chief negotiator in the past, he told me that, you know, we know each other so well, Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, at the official level as well, that if I sit in the place of the Greek Cypriot negotiator and the Greek Cypriot negotiator sit in my place, the place of Turkish Cypriot negotiator, we could defend the opposite position even better than we are defending our own positions. You know, so there is nothing to discuss, basically. Everything has been discussed, everything is on the table for, for a long time. The third outstanding issue, narratives. The narratives are still prevailing. The main competing narratives are prevailing mainly in the schools. Uh, educational, system, educational system in, uh, uh, in Cyprus, on the island, uh, has been always, or two, uh, there, there have been always two educational systems. Even when the Republic of Cyprus was a unitary republic with Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots as the main partner, we call this republic as a partnership republic actually, even then educational systems were in the domain and under control of communities. So there has never been joint educational system in Cyprus. It was the same during the uh, during the colonial time, during the British, uh, uh, British period, Turkish Cypriots, they were having their own schooling, and Greek Cypriots, they were having all their own schooling. Uh, what kind of methods, what kind of terminology, what kind of syllabus they have been using? Usually, the syllabuses and the, and the, uh, you know, uh, the readings and so on from motherlands. 
So Greek Cypriots were using or have been using uh, the uh, curricula uh, either overtaken or based on the curricula from uh, Greece mainland, and Turkish Cypriots have been doing the same vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, uh, Turkish motherland. Uh, this is, I'm not saying that there should be one educational system, but if you are teaching and if you continue teaching your kids in primary school the animosity between these two communities and at the official level, if you try to reconcile the conflict, uh, you are doing a schizophrenic job basically, right? I mean, there is a huge dichotomy because you are telling people that you should, they should hate the other, while at the same time you put the peace plan on the referenda and asking those people whom you told that actually the other is the killer, blah, 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 to agree with the, with the peace, yeah, or to agree upon the peace with, with the one whom you are blaming for everything. So I think that unless in uh, Cyprus they um, managed to do something, as for instance uh, French and Germans did, yeah, to come up with uh, common curricula, to come up to get rid of the language of uh, animosity and hatred and so on, and to come up with, with something more peaceful in the primary schools, I don't think that any peace plan would, would be lasting and viable in this, in this conflict. And I think it's valid for, for entire conflicts. And I don't understand why uh, the schooling, the curricula, is left uh, constantly behind in all conflicts. I mean, it's always the last thing to do, you know? It's always like, okay, later on, perhaps, I mean, we will tell the kids that the other is not an, such a bad person, you know? But, I mean, that's a, like a chicken-egg, you know, situation. And what we tell our kids today, they will tell their kids later on, and so on. So, I don't know. So, but basically, um, Turkish Cypriots were the ones uh, who, uh, who took the lead in this. And it was uh, President Talat, uh, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus President Mehmet Ali Talat, uh, who changed the curricula from like Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, the enemy and the good one, to more, uh, I don't know, like, you know, forthcoming. They were emphasizing the, uh, the history of the, common history of the island and so on and so on. But uh, then Talat lost in the elections and the new governance, the new, the new government, the new uh, um, under Dervish Erol, they, they uh, cancelled the new cur curricula and they went back to the old one, which is even worse to tell you the truth, because you are confusing them, the kids' minds, right? I mean, half a year they are taught something else and then the history books are taken. By the way, I'm not talking only about the history books. I share, a, it's not an anecdote, uh, I mean, in English language we would call it anecdote, but I think it's a very, it's a very pathetic and sad example. Uh, before 2004, the uh, European Union was emphasizing this, right? That, I mean, the, uh, basically the, um, the curricula and everything should be, should be somehow less, or should contain less animosity. So uh, there, was a, there was a time when uh, uh, Greek Cypriots, there are some Greek Cypriot villages in the north. So, so one of them is Deep Karpas, and there is a Greek Cypriot school, and uh, Greek Cypriots, they wanted to send their own teachers to Deep Karpas, which is on the Karpas Peninsula, to one of those, uh, one of those Orthodox schools. And they wanted to bring their own, uh, their own uh, literature, their own readings. It's a primary school. So, um, Serdar Denktas those days was responsible for checking those books, what they were going to bring to the, to the north. So, uh, he told me the anecdote that uh, he checked the mathematics, mathematic, mathematic book for, I don't know, fourth grade, fifth grade, I would lie now, I really don't remember, but something from the primary school. Yeah? So, he checked the books and one of the mathematic, uh, mathematical um, case was, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I should share it, but I think I should because it's a, it should, uh, it should ring the bells that nobody should do that. You know, I mean, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be done in any, in any part of the conflict in any part of the world. Uh, the case for kids was like this: um, you had 500 Turkish Cypriots, you killed 300 of them. How many more are left? Yeah, and this was a mathematic, mathematical, you know, basically. 
case to be solved by kids. So of course such a book was not accepted, of course such books don't exist anymore, but this is, this is something, you know, which is telling us how difficult it is to, to solve the conflicts while the narrative in primary school is based on the animosity. So I believe that this is maybe the most outstanding problem we have, we have today, a part of the negotiations which have been going on for ages and we had convergences and divergences between President Talat and President Christofias, they agreed upon everything almost, Unless this is changed in schools, politicians can agree upon whatever the people's minds, you know, will contain this, the seeds of animosity and uh, the main parameters wouldn't help. So more or less, uh, this, is the, this is the historical part. Now, what about Turkey? What about Turkish foreign, foreign policy and, uh, and the Cyprus issue? As we can see, as you know, and as you could, you could hear from me, uh, Cyprus and Cyprus conflict, uh, this have been part of Turkish foreign policy for ages, right? I mean, that's, that's always, there was a Cyprus desk, there is a Cyprus desk, there is, there is, a, there is a person responsible for Cyprus uh, in, a, in Ankara and so on and so on. I mean, it's, it, has been, it has been always an issue. But I will focus only on one of the aspects of the, uh, of the Turkish foreign policy related to Cyprus and it's Turkish EU membership. Uh, how these two, how these two have been, how these two have been connected, or what is the uh, when all this when all this happened? Uh, Turkey's aspiration, European Union aspiration, those days, uh, European uh, communities' aspirations, they go back to 1950, 1959. The association agreement or Ankara agreement was signed in 1960, 1963. And since 2005, Turkey is recognized as candidate country. Now, so since 2005, we have been negotiating, right? How many chapters we have been negotiating? The whole negotiation process is based on fulfilling the chapters, right? You open the chapter, you negotiate the chapter, you close the chapter. So how many chapters Turkey has been negotiating since 2005? Who knows? 35 chapters. It's a bit more than some other states, but approximately states are, or usually they negotiate between 33 and 35 chapters. So, what do you think? How many chapters we have, we have opened and closed since 2005? How many chapters have been concluded? Where is the Turkey's EU membership standing? Only one has been closed. <laughs> Uh, how many of them have been open? 14. 14 have been open. And uh, why do you think it's so? Why is it so slow? I mean, it's incredibly slow. Okay, I mean, there are many things Turkey should do by its own, right? Chapter 23, chapter 24, I can go on, and chapter 26, I can go on and on, you can check what the chapters are about. Uh, but what is the main issue? What is the... Yeah, no. Even if Turkey would like to do all this fantastic democratic, uh, you know, steps ahead and so on, would it help with respect to the chapters? It would help with respect to its own democratization process. But would it help with respect to the chapters, opening and closing the chapters? No. Because all these chapters, all those chapters which have not been open, cannot be open. They are so-called frozen, they are blocked. And they are blocked because of Cyprus. So that's why, I'm, as I said, I mean, I want to focus on the, I mean, yeah, the Turkish foreign policy. And uh, in, I mean, Cyprus has a place in Turkish foreign policy, but I will focus only on this dimension. So um, in 2006, in 2006, Council of European Union suspended eight chapters because of the Cyprus problem. It asked Turkey to actually, I mean, officially the technical, technical issue is that Turkey is asked to open its ports and, the, and airports to the Greek Cypriot flag vessels, Republic of Cyprus flag vessels. This is an actual requirement, it's correct, it's a requirement which is stemming from Customs Union, which Turkey, which is effective since, uh, which has been effective since 1995, but uh, uh, if Turkey does this, then Turkey would officially, it's a claim, 
I'm not uh, I'm not hundred percent sure whether it's whether it's correct. But it's being claimed that actually, if Turkey does this, if Turkey opens its ports and the airports to Republic of Cyprus flight vessels, then Turkey would officially recognize Republic of Cyprus. And Turkey, and again, that's a that's a claim that Turkey does not recognize Republic of Cyprus. Does Turkey recognize Republic of Cyprus? What do you think? Do we have a diplomatic mission in the Republic of Cyprus, in the Greek Cyprus? Is there any embassy, Turkish embassy, in the Republic of Cyprus? No. There is no diplomatic, uh, diplomatic relation between the Republic of Cyprus and the Turkish Republic. Do we have an embassy in TRNC, in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus? The island is divided into two entities. One of them is recognized only by Turkey, the TRNC, and the other is recognized by everybody but Turkey, right? All other states. So Turkey has an embassy in the north, in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. It doesn't have a mission in the Republic of Cyprus, in the Greek Cyprus, right? In the south. But thus, so this is actually leading many people to the conclusion that Turkey does not recognize the Republic of Cyprus. Is it correct? Why is it not correct? Well, uh, it's an obligation, but it's not the reason why Turkey is recognizing the Republic of Cyprus. It's an obligation, but Turkey would not base that, the fact that it recognizes the Republic of Cyprus, and I'm telling you that Turkey recognizes the Republic of Cyprus. I want to know from what I have told you and what you heard from me today, why I am right with the fact, or with say, uh, while saying that Turkey recognizes the Republic of Cyprus. What is the Republic of Cyprus based on? How it was established? What did I tell you? Three treaties. What are these treaties? <coughs> Guarantee, alliance, and establishment. Who are the guarantor powers? Britain, Turkey, and? Cyprus is the subject. Greece. Now, I said that these treaties are valid. And if they are not valid, if one of them is not valid, the entire Republic of Cyprus would cease to exist legally. So who is the guarantor? Is Treaty a guarantor? Yes. Is Treaty of Guarantee legally valid? Yes. How Turkey cannot recognize something which is guarant of which the, the very existent it's a guarantor? Of course Turkey is recognizing the Republic of Cyprus, is guaranteeing its existence according to the one of the international treaties which are valid. What is the problem then? Why don't we have a mission in the Republic of Cyprus? What is our problem? Why do we have all this? Why do I lecture about this? Why so much money has been spent, billions of dollars, for peacekeeping missions, for peace plans, for flying there and here, for paying experts, analyzing, fighting, military interventions? What, what the hell is the problem? Turkey doesn't recognize the government of Cyprus Republic, Republic of Cyprus. Because in international law, still, despite of the Estrada doctrine, right, we still have something which is called recognition of governments and recognition of states. Turkey does not recognize the fact that the Republic of Cyprus government is consisted only of Greek Cypriots. It is referring back to the constitution saying Turkish Cypriots are supposed to be there. Okay? So if Turkey opens its ports and the airports to Greek Cypriot vessels, it, it's, there is a possibility that it might be read that Turkey actually officially recognizes the fact that Greek Cypriots are representing the entire island, which is not true. So that's the problem, not that Turkey doesn't recognize the Republic of Cyprus, it is guaranteeing its existence. Yeah? So, uh, so, yeah, the Customs Union is actually asking Turkey to open its ports and the airports. Why? Why there is such a requirement? Why suddenly, in 2005, <coughs> Turkey had to sign the additional protocol to, yeah, to the uh, Ankara Treaty, when Turkey was recognized as the candidate country? Why Turkey had to sign the additional protocol to Ankara Treaty that it is supposed to open the ports and the airports? What is Customs Union talking about? Free movement of goods, right? 
European Union is based on three pillars. What are they? Free movement of services, goods, and labor. Custom union is about, customs union is about free movement of goods. Turkey shall not, as a part of customs union, shall not prevent free movement of goods. Opening of the ports and the, and the airports, is it really about the free movement of goods? No, it's about the free movement of services, right? But European Union made a linkage that without free movement of services, uh, you cannot provide with free movement of goods. So that's the logic behind this. Now, uh, again, I mean, this situation is like a chicken and egg. I said uh, that eight chapters, eight chapters have been suspended because of uh, because of this uh, uh, because of this additional protocol because of the customs union and Turkey not fulfilling the uh, the requirements stemming from the customs union. But in 2009, Republic of Cyprus unilaterally blocked another six chapters, and it blocked them just you know, just with the explanation that Turkey should recognize the fact that they are the official government and so on and so on. Later on in June 2007, France blocked another five chapters. But France did not block the chapters because of the Republic of Cyprus or because of the Cyprus issue. You know what was the, uh, what was the reason why France blocked those chapters? No, it said that if those chapters are very open, then those opening those chapters would bring Turkey closer to European Union. As if the meaning of the entire accession process is not, were not bringing Turkey closer to the Union. Why I mentioned this additional five chapters blocked? Because I wanted to point out uh, the, uh, you know, the hypocratic stance of European Union member states. With or without Cyprus problem being solved, I don't believe today uh, European Union, um, there are many European Union member states. European Union is not a homogeneous entity. They speak with one voice when it comes to certain issues, but some of the states are pro-Turkey membership, some of the states are against the Turkey membership, Turkey's membership. And those states who are against the Turkey's membership are hiding behind the unresolved Cyprus issue. That's why it is, you know, it's convenient to hide behind all this and not to spell the real reasons why they don't want Turkey in the European Union. So, what, what I'm, why I'm mentioning this is that uh, more and more, I have been always proponent of federal solution to Cyprus. I have always thought that we should work, all of us, to resolving the Cyprus issue, and that would help not only to have one less conflict in Eastern Mediterranean, but also to have, a, you know, somehow to help Turkey to become a become EU member. Now, uh, I think that uh, we should decouple these two. The linkage has been established. But I think that these two issues should be decoupled. European Union membership, Turkey's European membership, should be taken separately somehow, as much as possible, and resolving the Cyprus issue should be, again, try, we should try to solve it. Uh, you know, as much as possible uh, without the reference to the Turkey's EU membership. This linkage, by the way, was not done only by European Union. This linkage was done by Turkey as well, because it was playing to both, you know, to the cards of both sides. We all thought that it would be a great idea, you know, somehow to uh, hold each other tight and, you know. But I believe that we, we, we arrived at a point when uh, these two, this two should be these two should be decoupled. On 24th of January 2006, a uh, um, wonderful action plan, I believe it was really wonderful, uh, was suggested by, by Turkey. Because meanwhile, while I'm mentioning uh, all these chapters and uh, how Turkey, Turkey's EU membership is linked to the Cyprus problem and so on, uh, there is one more issue which I have not mentioned, and it's the isolation of Turkish Cypriots. Uh, Turkish, I, I said that Republic of, uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus is recognized only by Turkey, but on the top of it, Turkish Cypriots <coughs> cannot trade with anyone, you know, with any entity all around the world. So there are economic sanctions 
so-called economic sanctions, or it is believed that economic sanctions have been imposed on Turkish Cypriots, uh, to keep them underdeveloped, basically. I mean, officially no such sanctions have been imposed, and I mentioned that in, uh, in, in one of uh, our international law classes. Uh, neither European Union nor United Nations ever imposed economic sanctions on Turkish Cypriots. That's an only, it's an only like a issue of loyalty or goodwill or maybe lack of uh, interest, lack of knowledge of, uh, of states that they don't trade with Turkish Cypriots. There is no legal obstacle to opening the ports and the airports in Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus to the civil aviation, only the, only the Chicago Convention on the Civil Aviation, I mean, all, all the rules of the convention should be fulfilled. Um, so the action plan, why I mentioned this, is that uh, in 2000, uh, in uh, 2006, uh, 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 then Foreign Minister uh, Abdul Ahgul uh, suggested, or I mean, he announced the um, new initiative or initiative of Turkey. Uh, how to solve, how to resolve this uh, this issue, and it uh, it's called the action plan. If you are interested in uh, in this, it's on the foreign ministry website. The Turkish foreign ministry website is from 24th of January 2006, and uh, foreign minister Gül, then foreign minister Gül, uh, suggested that opening of the seaports of Turkey to Greek Cypriot vessels, uh, serving the trade of goods in accordance with the EC, Turkey Customs Union, should be done uh, in conduct with opening the ports in North Cyprus, including all those and, and ports and the airports, to international traffic, goods, persons and services. Since that time, and th this, was this would work basically, since that time, uh, many similar initiatives, every single European Union presidency uh, suggested similar, similar, similar plan, you know, to, to solve this issue simultaneously. None of them worked. Uh, since none of them worked, and since so much time and energy uh, has been spent uh, to solving the issue this way, I arrived to the point, or I came to the conclusion that uh, this is definitely not the way, and we have to be, we have to, we should try to find something new, something, uh, something which. Ha has not been spelled, maybe, openly, uh, but which might, uh, I don't know, shake the ground. And I think I'm not the only one, because International Crisis Group uh, recently published a report where they suggested that if the situation, if nothing is done towards the federal solution in Cyprus, then maybe two-state solution, which was so much feared uh, by, especially by the Greek Cypriots and so on, that should be tried. Um, this International Crisis Group report, which is also available at the internet, uh, is also talking about about the about the negative aspects of such a uh, of such a solution, and is actually pointing out the fact that that wouldn't be good neither for Turkish Cypriots nor for Greek Cypriots or Turkey or Greece or European Union and so on. But if nothing is done, something like this. Should uh, uh, should take place. By the way, as far as I know, Turkey has never launched a campaign for official recognition of TRNC. It is recognizing TRNC, but it has never stepped with all its power it has into into official recognition. You know, by other states of TRNC. So, I mean, something definitely should be done. Uh, something which uh, which would be thinking out of the box because the Many people are somehow hiding behind the unresolved issue, and uh, you know, I mean, you know better than I do that Eastern Eastern Mediterranean it's not the most peaceful corner of the world, and we don't need another conflict, which is you know Cyprus conflict has been frozen for decades. There are much more serious conflicts. It's easy to solve Cyprus issue, so why not to do that the way or the other? I haven't touched up on the gas issue, but uh, it's already half past ten, and I just uh, want to give the word to you now. So if you have any question about anything what I have not mentioned, and I have not mentioned many things, I know, 
I'll just try to summarize it as much as I could. So if you have any question about anything, it could be gas and oil, it could be, I have no idea, basically just, you know, what you want to ask. So, yeah, I would be happy to answer if I know the answer. Uh, so you are referring to the uh, to the economic situation uh, after the financial crisis in Greece and then later on the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, well, as far as I know, uh, I don't have uh, internal information, but as far as I know, Germany did not want to support uh, Greece or uh, Republic of Cyprus, but it did not want to lose the monetary union, right? So. Uh, it was not about uh, Greek Cypriots or Greece, it was about uh, its own financial stance and uh, its own money, basically, to put it in a, in a, in a, in a rough way. Uh, I don't think that uh, there are too many countries in Europe or in the world willing to give more money to Greece anymore. So we can see, we can see some shifts on the ground. But uh, we shouldn't forget that the bailout what Greek Cypriots uh, received from uh, from European Union, uh, I don't want to say that they were um, they were not uh, they were well, let's put it in this way they tried to get money from somewhere else as well. I didn't mention that, but uh, Russia is a big player in the Cyprus issue. It has been always from behind the scene, and. Uh, it has been always, as far as I can see, uh, it has been always tried to sabotate the uh, any any resolution of the Cyprus issue. Uh, one of the evidences when they did it, um, when the Anam plan was put on the referenda on 24th of April in 2004, and it was rejected. <laughs> Kofi Annan, who was then Secretary General of United Nations, he was really angry because he spent so much money, so much effort. There were five versions of Annan plan. He really dedicated a lot. United Nations dedicated a lot, and United Nations are the states, so states paid for it, right? Uh, so what he was trying to do, he was trying to put the Annan plan, even though it was refused, he was trying to put it to the Security Council agenda and get it uh, adopted as security in form of Security Council resolution. That would stay there officially. All permanent members voted for Russia veto this. Till that time, they were silent. The last moment when it was about uh, you know doing something in favor of the international community and the the conflict resolution, they vetoed it. Why do they do that? If there is my reading or my understanding of the situation is, you know that the Republic of Cyprus have been, has been trying to become a member of NATO. Turkey has been blocking Republic of Cyprus mem membership to NATO. The reason why Turkey is blocking is because the Cyprus problem is not solved and the government is consisted only of Greek Cypriots. If the government is consisted of Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, in other words, if the conflict is solved, Turkey wouldn't have a reason to block membership of Republic of Cyprus to NATO. Would Russia want membership of Republic of Cyprus to NATO? No, it's the last thing they would want. Okay. Moreover, they lost the bases in Syria, naval base. They have to look elsewhere. So, I mean, when it comes to money, I don't know. There might be some other sources. But again, with the crisis, oil crisis, the, the prices went down so much. I don't know how much uh, other states like Russia, for instance, are uh, in what position they are to help other countries you know, with the bailout and so on. But uh, I'm not that much hopeful, because we have seen the situation already. 
I was thinking when the crisis happened, that they would push Greek Cypriots to be more reconciliatory, but it did not happen. Again, it somehow, you know, the ground somehow settled slowly. So, you know, that major earthquake had happened already. <coughs> I don't think that, uh, you know, it can help a bit, but uh, it will not be the, it will not move the tectonic plates too much, I think. So we talked about economy, what we didn't talk uh, about is the oil and gas, or whatever other, whatever other question you have. I'm not expecting any questions from people who just came, because obviously they have no idea what we were talking about. So, uh, But those people who were here, they might want to ask something. There is a uh, oil uh, gas drilling going on in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, actually, it started much much earlier, but uh, since 2007, since uh, 2007, uh, the uh, licensing agreements uh, started being signed. Uh, it's uh, it added into the overall turmoil, and uh, I don't believe that many people are saying that uh, this uh, you know finding of the reserves, oil and gas reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean, can help resolution of the conflicts. I don't know about any conflict which was resolved by, uh, you know, by oil and gas, or oil or gas. Uh, just the opposite, I think that all conflicts were only aggravated by finding uh, additional resources of wealth. And we can see that in Cyprus issue as well, recently the sides uh, have been just quarreling about who has right, or, you know, Whose right is this to have the revenue from gas and oil drilling? Uh, I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there have been many uh, oil companies, uh, you know, exploring exploring the um, uh, the parcels in the in the Eastern Mediterranean, but uh, they found uh, much less than they hoped for. They thought that they would find they would find around uh, ten uh, TCF. Uh, trillion cubic feet. Now the recent uh, the recent reports are that they are in one of the blocks that they are about three to five maximum three to five TCF uh, trillion cubic feet uh, total energy. One of those one of those giants energy giants already pulled out from the agreements. Uh, why Greek Cypriot started drilling because of the economic crisis. It's what they were expecting. They were expecting revenue of $10 billion, which was exactly the money they needed for the bailout. It was exactly the deficit, what they were, what they were having. But the revenue, so it was, as far as I can see, it's more for uh, domestic consumption. They were trying, the politicians, Greek Cypriot politicians, were trying more to somehow calm down the domestic, yeah, the public, the Greek Cypriot public that lost money and so on and so on in the uh, in the economic crisis rather than rather than uh, i don't know like trying to steal some oil or gas from Turkish Cypriot's hands but when you look uh, at the i don't know who knows anything about this about this issue do you know anything about about this uh, drilling and the gas issue gas issue in uh, in Cyprus because if you don't, there is no meaning in, uh, in going into details. I would have to start lecturing again from the very beginning. That's why I asked whether there is any notion, any understanding of this issue. If yes, I would like to, I can actually elaborate more, but if not, then, uh, and if you don't have any questions, then perhaps we can, yeah? Thank you. I like your presentation. Uh, the Cypress case, if, the, if it is a Can you speak up a bit higher? Okay. The, the Cyprus case, if it is the main factor not to be a member for EU for Turkey, so if there is existence of willingness and commitment from Turkey's side to solve the problem, and if solved, it, Turkey will be a member because you said France, <coughs> uh, for five, France closed five chapters. So if it stayed open, uh, it would be like. Uh, for Turkey would be more close to be a member. So if there is a willingness from Turkey's side, if it is like a ground or helpful case, helpful 
cause to be EU member for Turkey because there is many criteria to be EU member. The Turkish people, uh, they are blaming the one reason they are saying the one is we are Muslims. That's why you are not willing to uh, take as a member. The other reason is the Kurdish issue. So if it is the other reason, how would I mean, the offi only official re reason, I mean, all these reasons, what you, what you mentioned now, nobody has officially spelled them out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some not official reasons. Mm -hmm. The Cy Cyprus issue is official. And that's why it is easy for some to hide behind them. Uh, Turkey is willing to solve the Cyprus issue, I'm convinced. It was not always like this. It was not like that in the past, but in the new foreign policy of Turkey, Cyprus problem is something which Turkey is really willing to solve. This is how I'm reading the situation. However, Turkey cannot solve it by itself. You know, it's a conflict. So I try to give you some examples of, uh, of the equilibrium up to where Turkey can go with its unilateral actions and when it is already counterproductive, both for the Cyprus conflict and for Turkey to take any unilateral action. What I'm saying is that if Turkey, if Turkey now unilaterally uh, fulfill all the, why do I speak into this? <laughs> I'm trying to avoid this. Uh, if Turkey unilaterally um, fulfill the cr criteria stemming from the customs union, uh, what would happen with the Cyprus conflict? Nothing. It would only fulfill criteria of customs union. It would only open its ports and the airports to Greek Cypriot vessels. Greek Cypriots would like to do it because it would increase their trade volume. It would increase their trade uh, uh, capacity, right? But what kind of effect it would have on solution of Cyprus conflict? Zero. It has nothing to do with conflict. The conflict is about something else. I'll try to explain you when it started, how it started, and what it is about. It has nothing to do with Greek Cypriot vessels or airplanes going to the Turkish ports. You know, and this is how it, how it was uh, simplified by the European Union documents. That's why that action plan from 2006 is, I think, something what we can still use. Because that action plan is saying, like, yes, I will open as a Turkey, I will open the ports and the airports, but then Greek Cypriots also should e easen the uh, isolation they imposed unilaterally on Turkish Cypriots. Then the ports and the airports should be done. All the things should be done in conduct. The same is valid for, uh, for the uh, educational system. I didn't say that, but I thought that it uh, somehow became obvious that Turkish Cypriots unilaterally changed the curriculum. Because Greek Cypriots did not do that at the same time, it didn't have any reflection on the other side, and then they went back to their old, you know, animosity, and so on and so on. So, I shouldn't say that, but I don't believe anymore in uh, confidence building measures, if they are taken unilaterally. Notice that in every single conflict, one side or the other is saying like, oh, you know, we need CBMs confidence building measures. Oh, like a unilateral step that would be a wonderful show off. You know, we would, we would feel like somehow encouraged to do something later on. But if, if the CBMs are not done at the same time, they are prone to result into something which is like a situation where one side feel, feels exploited and the other side gains upper hand. So again, in this case, yes, Turkey can do something. I mean, it, it is willing to do something. But I don't think that if it does it unilaterally, it would have any effect, any positive effect whatsoever. It has been done, it, it has been done in the past. At the same time, the situation or the environment in the Eastern Mediterranean is changing rapidly. It's getting more and more mixed and dangerous. I wish that, uh, you know, people were smarter and they were like uh, having a long-term vision rather than short-term vision, but I don't see that happening, to tell you the truth. And with respect to European Union membership, as I said, I think it should be decoupled from the, Europe, uh, from the Cyprus issue. It's, uh, it's creating problems both for Cyprus problem and for Turkey EU membership. Let it be. Let it be its own way and this 
its own way. I mean, we have exhausted everything, all the combinations of, uh, of this dualism, yeah? It didn't work somehow. Yeah? So, if there are no more questions, uh, uh, do we have anybody from uh, Orson here? Yeah? So, do we want to close up the session? Because I think that there are no more questions. Yeah. Okay. Guys, so thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. I wish you, I wish you good luck with, uh, with uh, the rest of this, uh, uh, of this winter school, and uh, yeah, it was great seeing you here. So thank you.